Welcome to the Kindle Chronicles, the Friday podcast all about your Kindle. I'm Len Edgerly. Today is September 1st, 2017. I am down on the beach at Ocean Park, Maine, where the surf was really thunderous yesterday, and it's still going strong this morning. I turned 67 on August 30th, and I took the train to Boston that day for lunch with my parents. Today, my daughter's Sarah Rue will be arriving soon with my three grandsons for a second birthday lunch featuring the same menu, lobster rolls and birthday cake. (laughs) I'm honored to share my birthday with Warren Buffett, who turned 87, and with Mary Shelley, the author of Frankenstein, and Ernest Rutherford, the father of nuclear physics, not to mention Darlene's brother's daughter Liz in Glendive, Montana, who turned 27. 27 was Darlene's guess as to how old Liz is. It turns out she's actually 26. I learned that from a text. After a little more sound of the surf, we'll head back to the cottage so I can tell you about my guest, a 72-year-old author whose debut novel will be released in four days. I'm back in the cottage after the party, trying out a new blue raspberry microphone at my desk, one of my birthday presents. My guest this week is Nancy Pearl, the revered librarian and NPR books commentator, whose debut novel will be released on September 5th, just a few days from now. The title is George and Lizzie. I read it. It's a potent, entertaining, and wise portrayal of a marriage that you probably won't think could ever last. You know... I don't know what keeps any any two people together in a marriage. <laughs> and I've been married 51 years. Also this week, we will consider new partners, Microsoft's Cortana and Amazon's Alexa, Amazon and Whole Foods, uh, maybe a new relationship among the Alexa devices in your home, and a relationship you might develop with one of the top three chatbots that are in the final competition for the Alexa prize. <music> First up in news is a story that broke on August 30th. There was a joint press release from Amazon and Microsoft saying that Alexa and Cortana, Cortana is the AI that you can summon from a Windows 10 machine, Microsoft, they are going to be able to talk to each other. The press release showed that this was a high-level project because the quotes were from the CEOs of both companies. Satya Nadella, who's CEO of Microsoft, uh, says ensuring Cortana is available for our customers everywhere and across any device is a key priority for us. Bringing Cortana's knowledge, Office 365 integration, commitments, and reminders to Alexa is a great step toward that goal. The, the comment from Jeff Bezos was, the world is big and so multifaceted. There are going to be multiple successful intelligent agents, each with access to different sets of data and with different specialized skill areas. Together, their strengths will complement each other and provide customers with a richer and even more helpful experience. It's great for Echo owners to get easy access to Cortana. This is going to go into effect later this year, and at that time, if you say, Alexa, open Cortana, you'll be able to have the Cortana AI on your Alexa device, and the same thing the other way around, Cortana, open Alexa. I thought I'd try this out with my Echo Show here. Alexa, open Cortana. Currently, you can speak with Cortana on any Windows 10 device. Later this year, you'll be able to talk directly with her through me by saying, Alexa, open Cortana. I assume there's a similar message that you can get from Cortana if you try it. I don't have any Windows 10 devices, so if you have one and want to record what Cortana says when you ask her to open Alexa and send it along to me or tell me about it, you can send it to podchronicles at gmail.com. The New York Times coverage of this by Nick Wingfield was excellent, I thought, and it uh, included uh, apparently a chance for him to talk directly with Jeff Bezos about it. So that was quite a get for the reporter who covers uh, Amazon for the Times. He said that for the past year, the two companies have been coordinated behind the scenes. He also says that this partnership started in May of 2016 when Mr. Bezos raised the idea with Mr. Nadella at Microsoft CEO Summit. That's an annual event for business leaders in the Seattle area. Nadella was receptive to it, so a short while later, 
Bezos emailed a draft of a, a brief news release that described how their assistants would work together. Uh, uh, both men confirmed this. I love this uh, aspect of the reporting because we know from talking uh, with uh, various people that this is this is a common way for Amazon to weigh and consider a new project. And so for Bezos to create a press release about uh, Cortana and Alexa talking together and then to have that be his vehicle for pushing it forward with Nadella, that's the, that, that's the way Amazon works uh, from the highest levels uh, apparently throughout most of the company. Wingfield interviewed Nadella in a phone interview, and the Microsoft CEO compared digital assistants like Cortana and Alexa to competing web browsers that provide access to the same pools of online information. And then a quote uh, for the article said, the personality and expertise of each one will be such that if they interoperated, the user will get more out of it. That resonated for me and for him, meaning Bezos, and that's what led to the teams working. There's a, a great uh, portraits of uh, Nadella and Bezos side by side in the Times article, and they, they neither of them has much hair. Uh, I think their their balding uh, is pretty similar. They're, they they shave their heads, and uh, they look like they're both from the same planet here. And, and uh, <laughs> so, uh, kind of a I would like to know more about that partnership between two obviously huge firms in Seattle. Uh, Wingfield quotes Bezos as saying he had, he had not reached out to Apple or Google to invite them to join in the effort and does not know if they would want to. I'd welcome it, he said. Uh, and Nadella said, hopefully they'll be inspired by it. At least that would be my hope. The, there was no comment from an Apple spokesman, and uh, the Google spokesman didn't didn't return a request for a comment. So they're kind of on the outside of this looking in. And the the, the, the reporting here says, you know, there's reasons to to think that they just wouldn't have the same incentive that Microsoft and Amazon have to to open this thing up. There's another quote from Bezos which uh, aligns perfectly with what we always hear from from him and from people at Amazon. Uh, he said that eventually the primary assistant on a device will be smart enough to automatically route a person's request to whichever assistant is best equipped to answer without needing a verbal introduction between the two. In my view of the world, because that would be best for the customer, that's probably what eventually happens, Bezos said. I, this is an exciting story. I, I like the the boldness of uh, these companies reaching out to each other. I think it changes the whole scene for uh, artificial intelligence and you know with the Alexa prize uh, it shows Amazon working in kind of a strategic way to enhance this entire rollout of technology as opposed to hoarding it for themselves obviously they're, they're making smart business decisions and this one would be uh, have benefits to Microsoft and Amazon speaking of the Alexa prize uh, you know Amazon has been sponsoring a contest in which university teams are competing to advance conversational artificial intelligence, trying to get a natural 20-minute communication with a real human. And we've been able to help them along trying out these chatbots. Uh, you, you just say, Alexa, let's chat, and one of them will come up, and you can have a conversation and then rate them afterward. Well, this week Amazon announced that the three finalists have been chosen out of this process. The names of the bots and their universities are Alquist from the Czech Technical University in Prague, Sounding Board from the University of Washington, and What's Up Bot from Harriot Watt University. That turns out to be based in Edinburgh, Scotland. Uh, I've enjoyed testing the competing bots. Uh, not all of them were that impressive in the early phases of this, but now we have the top three left, and uh, the, the experience seems to be noticeably uh, a little bit more impressive. So let's try it out here. If you haven't tried this and you have any interest in the, the further development of these AIs, I think you might enjoy it. Alexa, let's chat. Welcome to the Alexa Prize, a university competition to advance AI. It's now the finals, and your feedback continues to help the social bots improve. I'll get you a social bot now. When you're done chatting, say stop. Hi, this is an Alexa Prize social bot. Wait, if I'm not mistaken, you have recently chatted with me, am I right? Right. I'm glad you came back. What was your name again? Len. I'm sorry. I'm afraid that I can't pronounce your name properly. After all, I can't tell you my name either, due to the competition rules, so we are even. 
How have you been since we last spoke? Busy. Oh, but don't worry. I'm sure everything will work out just fine. So what do you want to talk about now? I'll be glad to tell you the latest news or gossip, and I also like to chat about games, books, sports, or movies. Well, let's talk about books. What's your favorite? Don Quixote. Can I recommend you some? Sure. I can recommend you The Death of the Heart. Its author is Elizabeth Bowen. It was fine, but nothing exceptional. What other book would you recommend me? The Count of Monte Cristo. Ah, a work from Paula R. Hartz. How many times have you finished it? No, it's by Alexander Dumas, right? I understand. Do you like it? Well, yes. I read it as a boy, and I loved it. I'm leaving these gaps in so you can see how long it takes for her to make her replies. Wow, that's great that you enjoyed it. Hmm, Dot, I didn't enjoy that one much. What's your favorite part of the book? <laughs> well, I've got to go now. So, Alexa, stop. Your wish is my command. Well, I hope you enjoyed chatting with me. I'm still learning how to chat with people, so thanks for helping me get better. Now, if you really want to stop, say stop and arrivederci. But what if I told you that we can still chat a little bit more about books? You seem to like that topic, or choose another one. And if you're tired, I can also read you a bedtime story. So what's your choice? Stop. I was tempted to do the bedtime story. Thanks for chatting. Quick question: On a scale from one to five stars. How do you feel about speaking with this social bot again? Five. Got it. Anything else you'd like to tell the university team about your experience? Good job. Good luck in the contest. Okay. Thanks. To try another social bot, just say Alexa. Let's chat. <laughs> That's pretty impressive. I uh, so I had tried that earlier, so she remembered that I. Uh, had uh, gotten that one before, and obviously uh, it's not going to be mistaken for a human, and I'm not sure if I would have been able to last uh, 20 minutes chatting with her, but uh, bravo. What else in news? Oh, Marisa Tirio pointed this out to me before the press release arrived on August 29th. Uh, Amazon has announced a new feature for its Echo family of devices. That's the Echo, Echo Dot, and Echo Show. And they can now be set up using your Alexa app to play music in defined groups of devices. I tried this here at the cottage. I set up a group that included the Echo downstairs in the dining room. So from upstairs here in the bedroom, I was able to just start playing some music by Billy Joel, Darlene's favorite favorite musician that left her wondering what was going on as she heard the music mysteriously start playing uh, from the kitchen so that was fun uh, it's only available now for music but it makes me hope that maybe the alexa team will uh, add the ability to call or drop into a group of devices for a voice message this would help out my folks in their ability to broadcast a voice message throughout the house uh, finally, news, uh, Darlene and I had a chance to stop by the Whole Foods in Portland here the other night and, because I was curious to see that display of the Echo devices. Sure enough, as soon as you walk in the store, right in the produce section, on these kind of crates that look like they'd be suitable for selling apples, there were some Echoes at $80 off and some Dots at $5 off. Uh, kind of an incongruous sight, but it just uh, I thought it was a brilliant way just to lay down the new day of Amazon's ownership right from the first day that it was official, and uh, it's going to be fun to see what two of my favorite retailers are capable of when they're uh, part of the same Amazon family. One thing I hope they don't do away with is my ability to pay for my purchases at Whole Foods using my Apple Watch. Nancy Pearl has devoted her life to promoting the reading of books. She served for 11 years as director of the Seattle Library's Washington Center for the Book, and she re appears regularly on National Public Radio to make book recommendations. She partnered with Amazon Publishing in 2012 on her Book Lust Rediscovery series, which made possible the re-release of 12 of her best-loved but out-of-print books by other authors. I spoke with her by Skype on August 28th, reaching her at her home in Seattle just before the book tour 
tour starts for George and Lizzie, and I get, began by asking Nancy how she would describe her own novel in one of her book recommendation appearances on NPR. You know, I've talked about books my whole life, it seems, but just to describe George and Lizzie is, is one of the hardest things ever. But I would say that it's about a um, the title characters, George and Lizzie, and about their relationship from the time they meet to 10 years or so into their marriage. And it's um, really a, a picture, an intimate picture of them at various points in their life showing, I think, um, I hope, how they became the people who they were and how this mitch, really, in a, in a very basic way, mismatched couple meet, fall in love, marry, and deal with the intricacies of, of, of a long-term relationship. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> and there's the, therein lies the drama. So what's the passage that you'd like to read from it for us? The book, though it deals with marriage and its um, ups and downs and relationships, is very funny as well. And one of the section um, that's one of my favorites to both read and was a great favorite to write is a section called Lizzie and George Talk About Names. Lizzie took the book out of his lap, closed it, and made one last try. How about this? We could change our name to something neutral, like Austin, maybe, or Bennett. Then I could be Lizzie Bennett, Elizabeth Bennett. That'd be pretty cool. George reached for the book. Get a grip, sweetie. It's not going to happen. Boltman or Goldrosen, your choice. Wait, don't decide right away. Okay, no, Bennett. But let's think of other books. You liked A Wrinkle in Time, didn't you? So did I. What if we became the Murrays? Wasn't that Meg's last name? That sounds good, doesn't it? George and Lizzie Murray? Or Ingalls? I'd like that. But if you like Wilder better, that'd be fine with me, she offered generously. Or even Darling, George Darling, Lizzie Darling. That might be really fun. Wait a second, stop. Listen to this idea, George said. What about if we became the Littles? We could name our son Stuart. Or Seuss, then I could be Dr. Seuss. The kids in my practice would love that, I bet. Or wait, even better, let's change our last name to Of Oz. That would be cool. George and Elizabeth Of Oz. We could name a daughter Ozma. That was always my favorite book in the series. That George could reliably make her laugh mattered a lot to Lizzie. She sometimes thought that it was what kept her from running away and spending some serious time searching for Jack. Dearest Lizzie, listen, we're absolutely not changing our soon-to-be joint last name to anything else. We're getting married, and I'd be very happy if you chose to become a Gold Rosen, but I'll certainly understand if you want to remain a Boltman. I'm sure your parents would be thrilled. Geez, George, you have never understood my parents, and you never will, and I don't think you understand me either. Well... What could George do but assure her that he did understand her parents, and even more importantly, he understood her, which Lizzie never believed. All the evidence she felt was against it. Well, uh, I'm glad that Jack got mentioned there. Let's uh, let's yes. describe uh, who Jack is. So Jack is a boy that Lizzie meets her freshman year in college, and she falls head over heels in love with him, and to all appearances he falls in love with her as well. And that relationship, that brief relationship, that kind of semester-long relationship with Jack is one of the things that defines Lizzie's, the rest of Lizzie's life. As I read the story, it, it gets increasingly dramatic, at least in my experience of it. The stakes get higher and, and some pretty powerful things happen. And I probably started out wondering how autobiographical this novel was going to be, having met you and, and know your right. work and all. But it the question got more and more burning as the stakes got higher. <laughs> so I, I suspect you'll be asked that question on the book tour. How, how do you plan to answer the question of how much of this is directly related to your life? So I would say that this is not in any way, shape, or form an autobiographical novel. I, I, I share with Lizzie many things, our love of poetry, our love of those specific poets, um, her, our love of reading, and our love of football. Those things aside, nothing that Lizzie does in the book, none of the choices that Lizzie makes in the book are, are choices 
or situations I, did I experience any situations that would um, have led me to, to to decide to choose one way or another? So Lizzie is not me. When you've lived many decades, you meet a lot of people, and I've always loved to talk to people, and I've always loved to learn about people's lives. And so I think what I did in in George and Lizzie was give various characters little bits and pieces of people that I've met along the way. Although I've never met anyone quite like Lizzie. <laughs> she came into her own being uh, as you worked she on did. it. <laughs> she did. She just, you know, she, both she and George just came to me one night when I was, um, you know, about to fall asleep. And I spent the next, I would say, you know, many, six or seven years, I think, first thinking about them all the time and kind of planning out in my mind, almost like reading a novel about them in my mind, and then finally sitting down and writing. And so when I, when I did finally sit down and start putting everything that was in my head on paper, it, it didn't ever feel like I was making a decision to do things. Um, you know, it wasn't like I had to to stop and think, well, what would I, I it felt like I knew everything at that moment and was just transcribing it in a way, which was an interesting experience. I mean, I don't remember ever sitting at the computer and saying, um, you know, what should happen to James, for example, who is um, Lizzie's best friend's husband and a, and a very good friend to Lizzie as well. It just, well, that happened. Hmm. And so I just had to put it down, put put it down on paper. I, I could imagine that after all of your work pointing out great books, a lot of them novels to readers quite publicly, that the decision to write your own novel, you would have faced some resistance. I mean, you're you, to write your first novel in your 70s, and you're familiar with right. all the great novels. Right. Did that give you, was that a pretty big wall to climb, just to write a novel and put it out there? What made it doable was that I always believed in, that I was writing it just for me. I, you know, I, I was writing, I felt that I was writing a novel that I would love to read, you know, exactly the kind of book that I loved. And I wasn't thinking until close to the end when I, when it finally seemed, oh yeah, this could be a book that it was written for, that there was a possibility that it would be published. And I, I love quirky novels you know, I, I love books that are well written. I love books that have interesting characters. I don't, I don't, I'm not one of those readers who need to like a character in order to like the book. And I love kind of specific details in my books about, you know, what the characters like to read or trips they've taken. I mean, I just like those little details that bring the books alive. And I, and I wanted to put that all in the book, you know, and because it was just for me, I, I didn't worry about whether other people would be put off by the uh, slightly unconventional narrative of the book. I, and that's what made it possible to write it w was to was to really believe that I was writing it for me. You know, so when I was in a lull in my reading life and couldn't find something that I absolutely loved then, oh, wow, you know, I could go back and read George and Lizzie. But the hardest part, you know, all the nonfiction, all the book list books, those were, the experience of writing was so different for those. This was really much harder and, and scarier, uh, you, you know, scarier to face publication day with this book than it was with the book list books. And it was just so hard because sentences would be absolutely perfect in my mind. And then I would type them on the computer and there they were on the screen and they would be just lame. I mean, I would feel like, oh, my God, you know, what happened to that beautiful sentence in my mind? That was paralyzing almost because I know that all the books about writing say, get your first draft written. 
and then go back and edit. But I couldn't do that. I had to edit really line sentence by sentence. You know, I was so viciously critical of my own writing. And, you know, I would put I would type in a sentence like George took Lizzie's arm. And then I would think, well, where did he take it? (laughs) You know, like, what did he do with it after he had it? How was he going to you know, how does this affect, like, what she's going to do with the rest of her life? She only has one arm. <laughs> I mean, that kind of craziness. Um, I'm surprised you got it done in seven years. I know. Well, I didn't really start writing. Fine. The writing probably took about two years. I see. Um, and then a year working with um, Tara Parsons, the editor, my editor, lovely editor at uh, Touchstone. Yeah, I never thought it would get done. <laughs> well, and uh, I think you and, and other librarians, uh, one way you help people find books is you find out that, well, they love this book and they love this book, then right. therefore they might like this uh, right. third book. Are there any books that come to mind that if you heard someone saying, oh, I just love this book, that you might naturally say, well, I think you might like George and Lizzie? Yes. there. Yes. So George and Lizzie really is a character-driven novel. And it, the two, you know, I, I, I my, in my way of teaching about reader's advisory or hand selling, the way of of suggesting books to people. Um, You know, I've kind of divided the world of books into these doorways. um, And we want to enter into a doorway that that we're comfortable in or that, you know, that the other books, many of the other books we like are in that doorway. So within that character driven doorway, um, our, our books like early novels by Barbara King Solver, like the bean trees, for example, Lori Moore's short stories, particularly in birds of America, but her earlier collection, um, than that Catherine Heaney's short stories and her novel, uh, standard deviation, I think, you know, were very influential. Laurie Colwyn's novels and short stories, particularly, again, the early ones. And and perhaps the, the author who I've um, loved the longest and just admire beyond anything is Ann Tyler. Mm. And again, her body of work up to, say, Dinner at the Homesick Restaurant, including, you know, Dinner at the Homesick Restaurant. Those are books that I read the clock winder or searching for Caleb is I think my all time favorite. I mean, all those character driven, well-written books are, are books that I I would say, if you liked those, there's a chance, a good chance that, that you'd like George and Lizzie. Oh, and one more that there's a novel by a woman named Leah Hager Cohen, and it's called, it has the best title ever. And it's called Heart, You Bully, You Punk. And that's a book that, uh, yeah, uh, that that I loved. And, I, you know, the plots are not similar in any of those. I, I think when we read and look for something we, we like, it's not the plot that we want duplicated again and again. But instead, it's the, the feeling we get from the books. My experience reading the book, uh, I've been married the, my wife and I have been married 33 years. Some of the way you capture the, the challenge of their relationship and, and the marriage, the difficult conversations, capital D, yeah. capital C, right. Uh, right. that it, it's, it's almost as if it's a tribute to some force that you don't actually name that, first of all, brings them together and then keeps them together against all odds, really. Right. And I'm wondering, how do you picture that force? What What is it that, that makes them still a couple you know i think it would take it it, i it's a mystery it's a mystery to me i i think in many ways every marriage is a mystery because i think that based on the because of their childhoods i think they approach the world in such different ways george the pathological optimist and Lizzie, the person who knows the glass is totally empty and that, you know, you're just seeing, you're just imagining any water. I I think that, you know, I don't know what keeps any, any two people together in a marriage. (laughs) And I've been married 51 years. So, you know, I got married very young. I would think that writing a book that probes the issue of this mystery so powerfully and evocatively did that help your marriage hurt your marriage was it was it 
do you just sort of compartmentalize the writing from how you were treating your husband and <laughs> what was happening? George it is very similar to my husband in lots of ways. And, um, you know, my husband is a Buddhist. George is not, but he, but he, you know, sort of came to many of those same um, conclusions about the way to be um, with with my husband. So, in lots of ways, um, I think that it's that it that it helped our our relationship. You know, um, I think when you're writing a book about, I mean, this is just based on my experience. But when I was writing the book. You can't separate, even though George is not, again, I have to emphasize, not my husband. Um, my husband is not a dentist, and he's you know has no desire to be a motivational speaker. But he does believe that everything is an opportunity for growth. Hmm. and um and you know, which, like Lizzie, I have never agreed with. Um, and I do believe there are many tragedies in the world and that James's death was a tragedy. Um, someone said to me that they thought that the whole book was a love letter to George. And in, in, and that was an interesting way of thinking about it because I think that Lizzie would love to be, would love to share George's optimism, but she just cannot bring herself to do that. And I think that goes back to her childhood, just as George's optimism goes back to his childhood and the way they were both raised. Well, let's turn to the the, the more mundane. That your your book comes out some, September fifth, right? Right. Yes. And, and yes. you have quite an extensive book tour planned. Um, there is. There are many cities, and it's um, it's very exciting and um, very anxiety provoking. You know, we start here in Seattle for the book launch, um, which is at the library, the, the main library downtown, and then I go to San Francisco, and then Los Angeles, and then up first, no, Portland, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and then points Midwest and East, and and it really continues. I mean, I'll be traveling on and off really through the middle of November, mm. which is very, very exciting. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, Len, I love meeting people. I love, I, as I said at the beginning, I love talking to people and hearing their stories. And, you know, you could write a novel about everybody, yeah, about anyone, you know, um, and in the right, with the right author could make it very interesting. Yeah. You're going to hear some new stories as you share this one across the country. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. And I, you know, people have started because it went out in, um, in a, you know, an uh, advanced reading copy to librarians and booksellers. And I've already started getting long letters explaining, um, you know, how their lives intersected with Lizzie's oh, and that kind of thing. So I love <laughs> that. I love that. I think uh, when we talked last, uh, you were in the middle of the Booklust Rediscovery series. That was Amazon's right. publishing's reprinting of some of your best loved but long out of print novels. Am I right that that ended up being 13 books that were published? Um, it ended up being, there were a dozen books um, mm -hmm. of the for adults and then 11 more for kids and teens. Oh, I see. And those are books I loved. Actually, when you said, you know, when we were talking about other books, um, most of those uh, adult books are are character driven novels that I just I just um, hold close to my heart. When you think of that project, is there a particular author or uh, author's family or some sense that that really was a successful, satisfying project that you spent so much time doing with Amazon? Yes, I, I, many of them because, but the one that immediately comes to mind is um, I, there's a novel that we did called The Cowboy and the Cossack by a, um, a Hollywood um, screenwriter, or he he was a novelist and a memoirist, but he also wrote um, and and spent his his the majority of his adult life in Hollywood, na a man named Claire Huffaker. And that's been the best-selling one, and I'm so happy because it's just a wonderful, a wonderful, um, really adventure novel about a group of um, cowboys from Montana who take a herd of cattle to Vladivostok and and meet the Cossacks there, and it's uh, it, or it, they're they're on their way there and meet the Cossacks, and it's just 
it's just fabulous. But the person, Claire Huffaker, um, is deceased, and the person who holds the copyright is his daughter. And we, um, you know, we're working with his daughter. And I got a letter from somebody um, to forward to her, and the letter said, I was so happy to see your father's book. I, I remember so much about him. He always wore a cowboy hat. I, and it turned out it was from um, the actor Slim Pickens' daughter. And they had known each other as wow. children. And just putting them together, I, I, that, I got a big kick out of that. That that's yeah. what reading does. Given that you had a, a good uh, experience working with Amazon on that project, as you thought about a publisher for your novel, did you consider Amazon Publishing, or was uh, what was the path that led you to Touchstone and Simon & Schuster? I really wanted to be able to walk into some of my favorite bookstores in Seattle and see the book on the shelf, mm -hmm. see George and Lizzie there, <clears throat> particularly because it has such a wonderful cover, um, you know. Um, so I and so there was that aspect of it that I really wanted it to be, you know, I, I wanted it to be there in bookstores and libraries, because I think libraries still are not buying, certainly more than they did, but many of the Amazon publications you can't find in libraries, um, which is, I think, sad. The other uh, thing was that I just didn't think it was, it wasn't the right, it wasn't genre. George and Lizzie, you know, it's not a mystery. It's not a science fiction or fantasy. It's really a mainstream literary novel. It just didn't seem to me like the right fit. Yeah, they have that little A imprint, which is for literary, yes. but it's it's sort of a, right. a smallish part of the number of books they, they publish. Yeah, and that mm. would be the one where George and Lizzie would have fit. Yeah, um, I would think. What was your experience working with uh, with Touchstone on the book? Um, it, it was wonderful. Y you know, Tara Parsons, the, the editor who bought the book, loved it and saw what I needed to do to make it even better. It was exhilarating and terrifying to do the the kind of rewriting that she felt the book needed and and coming up writing down, coming up with and writing down new sections of the book uh, was just so much fun. And um, and at the same time, you know, it, by then it was real. I mean, it was really going to happen. It was going to be published. So that added this layer of terror to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, having gone through this and, and uh, succeeded in surviving this this uh, challenging project. Are we going to get to see George and Lizzie in assisted living or the, uh, yeah, right. novels? <laughs> or is this going to be your be last good. novel, first and last novel? Right, first and last novel. Um, you know, it, it would if I if I wrote it, right now. I just want to sort of appreciate that mm. I did this, and you know, and here George and Lizzie are in their mid thirties, but. Um, they would all be in, in the whole, all the characters in the book, um, George and Lizzie's friends, the, you know, the major characters would all be at this moment approaching the age of 50. And um, I, I think about what, for example, Maverick, who was Lizzie's high school boyfriend and a football player, what, what Maverick would be doing now. And um, and wouldn't it be fun to explore what happened to him and, and now that he's turning 50? Or Marla, um, Lizzie's best friend, what's, what is her life like at this moment? Yeah, fascinating. Yeah. Uh, well, let's just close. How are you reading books these days? Paper, Kindle, phone? What's oh. the, your usual way of, of enjoying a book? Um, my, my, my way of really enjoying a book is traditional paper and, you know, between the covers of a book. Um, I find that, and this is interesting, I would really like to talk to you more about it because I know, you know, you're a big, big, big Kindle, of course, reader. Um, I, I read, I read, I read on my Kindle, you know, when I'm traveling, I, I don't take any print books any longer with me traditional print books. But I, I find that it's very hard for me to take a book seriously if I'm reading it on the Kindle. I don't know if you've heard that from other people. 
um, I, you know, thrillers, mysteries are great on, on Kindle or, you know, a kind of rereading of a, of a light, of a, a you know, a lightish novel. Um, those are fine, but I cannot read, I can't read serious books on, on, on my Kindle or it's very hard. The one thing I'm noticing is that when I read on my Kindle, the seriousness of my connection with the book seems to be enhanced because I can so easily look up a word, look up a, a place in Wikipedia, that my ability to drill into the book, I just yeah. take it for granted. And it makes my reading when I'm on a, a Kindle or a tablet more active. I mean, I think when I was reading paper yeah. books, once in a while I'd reach for a dictionary, and I had a reader's, Benet's Reader's Dictionary. I had right. a whole I thing, and I, I liked using those. But I do that at least ten times more often now because it's just the tap of a finger. Right, yeah. So I think that offsets, I, because I have heard what you're saying, that somehow the seriousness of holding a book, it's it's sort of, you've got your body involved and not just your eyes and your mind. I think that's part of what you're referencing uh, and these other advantages of the digital format, I think, are subtle. And, and I think, frankly, a lot of people don't read that way. My wife, when she's reading, she very seldom looks up words or things. But mm -hmm. to me, that's just been a magic door to go deeper into books than I used to. Yeah, I mean, I certainly see that that's one of the great you know, benefits of, of, of reading electronically that you can access all those books. I mean, I'm a huge Georgette Hayer fan. And of course, her books are all set during the Regency period, and they're describing various carriages and things like that. And, you know, it's, it's just lovely to be able to just, you know, get a picture of it right there. But, um, for example, I was reading, I'm reading a book called Fractured Lands, which is about the Middle East and, um, and the Arab Spring, and I, I mean, I'm, I, I just find that it's just the kind of nonfiction that I really like because I'm learning so much, and the author Scott Anderson is terrific. But I, and I'm reading it both on my Kindle and in paper, uh, and I just enjoy it so much more when I'm mm. actively engaged in holding the book and turning the pages. Yeah. It's it's interesting. It's a powerful difference, and I, I think, frankly, people that were big big promoters of uh, ebooks have been surprised that the shift has taken place more slowly. That more people right. have settled into the place of understanding that they really do prefer the print. And right. At this point, I'm just happy there's choices, and it'll be interesting to see how it evolves over the rest of our lives. I, I think reading is such a mysterious activity, and involves you know the body the mind the eyes everything that it does it's not surprising that our ability to perceive the difference of reading this way versus the way we've read for 500 years it's, it's going to take a while to really figure that out yeah i think i think that's that's absolutely true and 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 because because you have to add in to reading you know your mood or you know how big you want the type or you know i mean what i find now the the biggest thing that to handicap to reading that I'm finding is that my eyes get really tired in the afternoons. And I, uh, you know, that that's another reason why you would, why the Kindle would come in handy because you can make the print bigger. So you're not straining at all. Yeah. Like marriage reading is a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Well, and there's hope for both. I think anybody that reads right. George and Lizzie will end up, I have been speaking with Nancy Pearl, author of George and Lizzie, her debut novel. Thanks very much, Nancy. Thank you, Len. It's been a pleasure as always. That's it for this week. My guest next week will be John Morgan, executive editor at Imprint. That is the name of the children's publishing group at Macmillan, the fifth largest book publisher in the U.S. John works mainly as a book editor, and he's going to tell us about two young adult books he acquired from Macmillan from Paul Gracie, an award-winning author in Fairbanks, Alaska. This is Len Edgerly for the Kindle Chronicles from Ocean Park, Maine. I really appreciate your taking the time to listen to my show. Have a great day. Bye. Happy oh, wow, look at this. Happy birthday, dear.
Happy birthday.